Hello everyone, I am Brandon Sanderson, author of the Mistborn series and the Stormlight Archive, and the last book, three books of The Wheel of Time. I hope you are staying safe over there in Italy. Uh, I hope you are enjoying this convention during these uh, different times. I have enjoyed being able to be a guest at a lot of different conventions that I maybe wouldn't have had been able to make otherwise. And so this has been kind of fun for me, but at the same time, I don't get to see people. So instead of speaking to a crowd that will respond to me, I'm speaking to a camera. I hope that, however, you will still enjoy this. Um, I appreciate all the enthusiasm I get out of Italy, and I'd like to visit again uh, as soon as it is safe to do so. For now, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about something. They asked me to, uh, to prepare a few words uh, for the convention and give a guest of honor speech. And something I've been thinking about a lot lately is geek or nerd culture and how it's becoming very mainstream, right? When I grew up, no one had read fantasy books but my most close group of friends. And these days, we have things like the Marvel Cinematic Universe and we have things like you know, the, uh, the new Lord of the Rings adaptation coming up and uh, a lot of the culture that was very um, small scale, uh, limited to a few people when I was growing up has exploded. And this has been a great thing. Um, but there's also some challenges that come along with it. To explain this, I want to talk to you a little bit about how I became a fantasy writer. Uh, I discovered writing because of a teacher I had when I was in the eighth grade. And she gave me a book to read. I'll talk a little bit more about that specific book later. But it was, uh, it was a transformative time for me. I read this fantasy novel and my entire outlook on the world changed. I found something that really felt like me. I connected with this story and this type of story in a way I never had before. Um, and it, it uh, was what made me want to learn to be a writer. Um, you could say that I was a fantasy nerd and embryo who did not yet know. Uh, and so I really am thankful for that teacher. And another thing that was really foundational during this time, and um, maybe uh, will be reminiscent to many of you of something that happened in your life, is I discovered my local comic book shop. It's called Cosmic Comics in Lincoln, Nebraska. Nebraska is like, right smack dab in the middle of the United States, uh, kind of the middle of nowhere, though I enjoyed uh, growing up there. And one day I noticed there was this little comic store. It was actually in a strip mall um, that was near a supermarket. It didn't feel like the place that you would normally see a store like this. And I peeked in and they had everything I could ever want. They had comic books, they had fantasy and science fiction novels only. Didn't have a huge selection of books, but they had all the science fiction and fantasy books and they had games. Um, and this became like Mecca for me. This store is where I bought, bought my first pack of Magic the Gathering cards. This is the store where I bought Eye of the World, the first book of the Wheel of Time, which eventually I would go on to complete. Uh, this is the store where I bought my first issues of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the old Eastman and Lair comic, which was the first comic book series that I ever got into. Um, it provided everything for me. Um, and beyond that, it provided a community. Uh, one of the things I love about going to my local comic book shop was that I would find other people there who were like me. And as I said at the start, this was not um, a given during that time. You could find people who were interested in these kinds of pursuits. Uh, it was actually kind of difficult. Um, uh, a lot of my friends in school, this wasn't something they were into, these fantasy novels and things like that. And so uh, being able to go to the store and being able to connect with this crowd and this community, uh, finding role-playing groups and discovering role-playing games, uh, finding people to just sit down and have a casual game of Magic the Gathering with, finding people to talk, at, talk to about fantasy novels. I mean, this was foundational in my life. And this community, I learned to find wherever I went. When I went to college, I found the community 
Um, and this community at college was putting together a magazine of science fiction and fantasy, of which I joined and was my first experiences in publishing. Kind of what taught me that I could do it, that I could maybe be a writer, was seeing this community together creating a fanzine, essentially, a fan science fiction magazine. And it was uh, it's wonderful that these communities existed uh, in these pre-internet days. Um, nowadays, this is becoming a, a major force. Um, and yet one thing that worries me is that now that things that we love, uh, things that people like myself love are becoming more and more accepted, some of us, I feel this instinct myself, are responding against that and saying, well, these people aren't true fans. These people are co-opting this thing that was part of my identity. Um, and that worries me. It worries me that the thing that we've always wanted, people to appreciate our interests, is happening. And yet, sometimes we respond poorly to that. And I include myself in that crowd. Um, something that is useful to understand, at least about me, is that first fantasy novel I read. And I hope that explaining why this book connected with me will help us explore the larger um, story of people coming to love science fiction and fantasy and games and comics and all these wonderful things that were so foundational in my childhood. The book that I was given by that teacher is a book called Dragon's Bane. Now, Dragon's Bane is a fantastic novel. I would recommend it to anyone. Um, it, I've read it again as an adult and I love it still. Uh, but it is not the book that should have worked for me. You see, by the normal understandings of what kinds of books you should give to a young man who was, as I was, a reluctant reader, you should probably give them a story about a young man maybe going to wizard school or a young man getting given a magic sword and sent out on a quest. These are the sorts of normal things that you would give to a new reader, particularly one at my age of 13 or 14. Dragon's Bane instead is about a middle-aged woman having a midlife crisis. Um, it is the story of a woman who had been told her whole life by her teacher in magic that she could probably be one of the most powerful magic users ever if she would just dedicate herself to her magic. And yet she had a family. She had children. She uh, divided her time between her family and her work, so to speak. And the story is about uh, there's a dragon that's come to terrorize the kingdom. And so a lone messenger has been sent to find this man who is her husband, um, who is the only living uh, dragon slayer. And he's now older. They're both older. He killed a dragon when he was very young. But this messenger shows up and says, we really need you to go kill this dragon. And so the plot is about these two older people uh, in their, you know, their, their middle years going and finding a way to kill a dragon uh, with their wits rather than just by riding up with a sword like he did when he was younger. Um, but it's the character arc is about her kind of balancing her love for things mystical, her love for dragons themselves uh, with how much time she's willing to give to it. And I just love this story. It shouldn't have worked by the common understanding of books you give to teenagers, but it did. It was amazing and it taught me something. You see, during this time in my life, um, my mother had graduated when she was younger, first in her class in accounting, in a year where she was the only woman in most of her accounting classes. Um, she was offered a very prestigious scholarship to go become a CPA, and she actually turned that down. Uh, she was pregnant with me, and she decided while I was young, she wanted to be with me um, in those formative years. And she later went on and had a great career as an accountant, um, but those early years, she had given up some very important things for me. Now, as a teenage boy, I, of course, thought, well, of course she did. I am me. Who wouldn't give up a promising career for me? Uh, and I had never quite understood this. So I'm like, of course, that's what you would do. That's what a parent would do for a child. And yet I'm reading this book and I'm empathizing with the woman becoming a wizard. I'm like, why would you spend time with those stupid kids? Go practice your magic. Go hang out with dragons. This is wonderful. Leave that family. Um, and I got done with this book, which is a story about 
you know, dragons and knights and wizards and witches. And I understood my mother better. Um, this is part of what made me so interested in the fantasy genre and in becoming a writer is that through giving me this wonderful adventure, this author, Barbara Hamley, had really given me insight into someone who was very different from myself. And indeed, I think this is the power of the media that we love in so-called nerd culture. Um, this media requires a bit from us, whether it's a comic book story, whether it's a complicated board game, or whether it's a big epic fantasy novel. We put a lot of investment into learning how to use these things, learning to play Magic the Gathering, learning to play even a simple uh, board game takes effort, takes work, and that's kind of what we love about it, right? Like, if you're like me, part of the reason I love epic fantasy is that it does challenge my imagination. It forces me to stretch. It forces my, it's like, it's like exercise for your imagination. And that is one of the reasons why I love it so much is because it doesn't coddle me. It expects a lot of me, but then it rewards me. You spend a lot of time invested in learning a world like uh, Westeros or uh, Middle Earth. And then as you read the future books, that work is rewarded. You are now an expert in this world and can read these wonderful stories and experience them. And I think this kind of sometimes accidentally leads us to a little bit of elitism. Um, we, you know, play Magic the Gathering or we play a really complex board game um, and we really get into it. And then when someone else wants to play with it, we say, well, you don't want to do this because it's really hard and it's a lot of work. You don't want to pick up this book series. It's too hard for you. Um, and this attitude does lead us to being exclusionary. It's very natural. We have this thing we love, we want to protect it, we want to treat it really well. And yet, in doing so, I think we are abandoning one of the biggest strengths that our culture has, and that is the ability to connect people. Uh, this is something that I feel like our world needs a lot more of right now. It, strange, but as we've connected more through the internet, as the world has become a smaller place, it's also become a place where we seem to isolate ourselves more. It seems to become a place where we enter echo chambers and only are willing to listen to people like ourselves. We are able to much more easily find enclaves of like-minded individuals, and so we aren't forced to interact anymore with people who are different from ourselves, which is really strange to realize in that the world becoming bigger, our circles of influence are becoming smaller. And this worries me, it worries me a lot. It worries me when the fantasy genre um, gets into a rut of doing the same things over and over, or when a very big novel series breaks out that maybe is YA or that uh, is a little more um, introductory in its themes. And so people say, well, that's not, that's not true fantasy. Fans of that, aren't real fantasy fans. And this really bothers me because it undermines what our selling point is, um, the greatest thing about our genre. Um, during these last 15 years that I've risen to prominence, I've been able to travel the world. Uh, it's been amazing to see so many different places and people. And one place that I felt was most different um, from my experience was when I visited uh, the United Arab Emirate on tour. I was invited to a book uh, festival there. Now I'd been around the world, um, I'd been to many different places at this point, but I'd never been to the Middle East. And I was a little worried, I'm like, do people really read my books in the UAE? I'm not published in Arabic, um, do they really? And I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure if I was going to show up at this place and be, you know, um, this lone author back to the days where nobody showed up to my signings. But I went because I wanted to see this place. Um, and I, I had a wonderful time. And the first day of the conference, I walked in to the place and was led to the place where I was going to do book signing. And there was a line of people in, um, uh, 
Emirati clothing. Uh, the women were veiled. Uh, the men were wearing the fob. Uh, you know, different from my experience completely. And they all had big stacks of Brandon Sanderson books. And I sat down and the first woman in line um, was so excited and we talked about our favorite Star Trek captains um, and connected over the fact that we both had loved this piece of media. Uh, another woman in line, I remember chatting with her and she was going to Dubai Comic Con and if you guys have seen Miyazaki films, she was going to go as No Face, the, uh, the character from Spirited Away, which is, I thought, a really perfect um, way to both use this woman's traditional dress and the, and the veil and also be a character from a piece of media that I think is fantastic. Um, and we bonded, the, those people in line and myself, and it reinforced to me again how much our media and our love of these things shows that we as human beings are fundamentally down deep the same. We might have different disagreements on, uh, on various surface level things, but deep inside, a good story connects with us because we see ourselves in that story. And so my challenge to all of us is that we will be a little bit more open uh, to those who want to join our community. When something gets really popular, we will be happy that others are being able to experience a bit of what we love, that we will share our passions, that we will be those experts in the things that we love and let that make us into mentors instead of gatekeepers. And that is my challenge to you. That is my request to the entire community. Uh, thank you so much for reading. Uh, thank you for supporting my books uh, as we've done this launch of Rhythm of War in Italy. It's a real challenge to get these Stormlight books translated and out, and the publisher really stepped up. Um, and so thank you so much. Now, I'm actually going to read a little bit from Rhythm of War. Uh, the new book that's out. I, um, I really like doing readings and I like finding places in my books where I can, uh, I can interpret the characters out loud uh, and things like that. And I thought you all might enjoy hearing from the new book. But one of the things that's happened with this book is we released um, audio editions um, of the first chapters on my YouTube channel just so that people could preview them and things. And so I don't want to read one of those chapters because you can already go if you really want to and listen to the audiobooks of those, uh, those chapters. So instead, I'm going to read to you from one of the chapters that comes right after that. Um, this is one of the interludes. It does offer mild spoilers for the uh, other parts of the Stormlight Archive. So if you haven't started the series, you might want to wait. This isn't the biggest spoilers that have ever existed. Um, it's uh, a viewpoint from a side character, uh, but it might be something that you would want to um, wait for. If you are caught up on the Stormlight Archive, um, uh, then this shouldn't uh, spoil anything too much for you, even if you haven't read the fourth book yet. So I'm going to read the second interlude of the Rhythm of War, the fourth book of the Stormlight Archive. Ja'anat had been named Taker of Secrets long ago by a scholar no one remembered. She liked the name. It implied action. She didn't simply hear secrets. She took them. She made them hers. And she kept them from the other unmaid, from the fused, and from Odium himself. She flowed through the Kolinar Palace, existing both in the physical and cognitive realms. Like many of the unmade, she belonged neither to neither one fully. Odium trapped them in a halfway existence. Some would manifest in various forms if they resided too long in one place, or if they were pulled through by strong emotions. Not her. Sometimes fused, or even common singers would notice her. They grow stiff, looking over their shoulders. They glimpse a shadow, a brief darkness, quickly missed. Actually seeing her, though, required reflected light. It was similar in Shadesmar. She experienced that realm at the same time as she experienced the physical realm, though both were shadowy to her. She dreamed that somewhere a place existed that was completely right for her and her children. For now, she would live here. She flowed up steps in one realm, but barely moved in the other. Space was not entirely equal between the realms, 
It wasn't that she had a foot in each realm. More, she was like two entities that shared a mind. In Shadesmar, she floated above the ocean of beads, her essence rippling. In the physical realm, she passed among singers who worked the palace. Ja Nott did not consider herself the most clever of the unmade. Certainly, she was one of the more intelligent, but that was not the same. Some of the unmade, such as Narogal, sometimes called the Thrill, were practically mindless, more like emotion spread. Others, such as Ba'ado Mishram, who had granted forms to the singers during the false desolation, were crafty and conniving. Ja Nott was a little like both. During the long millennia before this return, she'd mostly slumbered. Without her bond to Odium, she had trouble thinking. The Everstorm appearing in Shadesmar, long before it had emerged into the physical realm, had revitalized her, had let her begin planning again. But she knew she was not as smart as Odium was. She could keep only a few secrets from him, and she had to choose carefully, clouding them behind other secrets that she gave away. You sacrificed some of your children so others could live. It was a law of nature. Humans didn't understand it, but she did. She. He was coming. God of passion. God of hatred. God of all adopted spren. Ja not flowed into the hallway of the palace and met with two of her children, touched windspren. Humans called them corrupted, but she hated this term. She did not corrupt. She enlightened them, showing them that a different path was possible. Did not the humans revere transformation, the ability of all things to become something new, something better? As a core ideal of their religion, did they not look at this item? Yet, they grew angry when she let Spren change. Her children darted away to do her bidding. Then one of her greater children manifested, a glowing and shimmering light constantly changing, one of her most precious creations. I will go, mother, he said to the tower, to this man, Mraes, as you have promised. Odium will, Odium will see you, she replied. Odium will try to unmake you. I know, but Odium must be distracted from you, as we discussed. I must find my own way, my own bond. Go then, she said, but do not bond this human because of what I said. I merely promised to send a child to investigate options. There are other possibilities there. Choose for yourself, not because I desire it. Thank you, mother, he said. Thank you for my eyes. He left, following the others. Ja not regretted that the smaller two, the enlightened windsprend, were essentially distractions. Odium would see them for certain. Protect some children, sacrifice others. A choice only a god could make. A god like Ja not. She rose up, taking the form of a woman of streaming black smoke with pure white eyes. Shadows and mist. Odium's pure essence. If he were to know the deepest parts of her soul, he would not be surprised, for she had come from him, unmade by his hand. But as with all children, she had become more. His presence came upon her like the sun piercing the clouds, powerful, vibrant, smothering. Some fused in the hallway noticed it and looked around, though the common singers weren't attuned enough to Odium's song, like a rhythm, but more resonant one of the three pure tones of Roshar. She didn't fully understand the laws that bound him. They were ancient and related to compacts between shards, the high gods of the Cosmere. Odium wasn't simply the mind that controlled the power, the vessel, nor was he merely that power alone, the shard. He was both, and at times it seemed the power had desires that were counter to the purposes of the vessel. Ja not, a voice infused with the tone of Odium said to her, what are these spren you have sent away? Those that do your bidding, she whispered, prostrating herself by pooling down onto the floor. Those that watch, those that hear. Have you been speaking to the humans again to corrupt them with lies? That was the fabrication she and Odium played at currently. She pretended that she had contacted the Radiant Shallan and a few others working on his behalf, anticipating his desires. He pretended he didn't know that she had done it against his will. But both knew she wanted more freedom than he would allow. Both knew that she wanted to be a god unto herself. But he didn't know for certain she was taking actions to undermine him, like when she'd saved Shallan and her companions from death in Kolinar. She had play played that off as accidental, and he couldn't prove otherwise. If Odium caught her in a verifiable lie, he would unmake her again, 
steal her memory, rip her to pieces, but in so doing, he would lose a useful tool. Hence, the game. Where have you sent them? he asked. To the Tower Lord, to watch the humans as we've discussed. We must prepare for the bondsmith's next move. I will prepare, he said. You focus too much on the Tower. I'm eager for the invasion, she said. I would, will very much like to see my cousin again. Perhaps they can be awakened, persuaded. Odium had likely planned to send her on this mission, but her eagerness now gave him pause. He would follow her children and see that they were indeed going to the Tower. That would reinforce his decision, the one she hoped he would make right now. You will not go to the Tower, Odium said. He ha hated how she referred to the sibling, the slumbering child of honor and cultivation, as her cousin. We but we are about to make a ploy with the betrayal of the man Teravangian. You will watch him. I would be of more use in the Tower, she said. Better that I. You question? Do not question. I will not question. However she, however, she felt a surging to the power that moved within him. The mind did not like being questioned, but the power, it liked questions. It liked arguments. It was passion. There was a weakness here in the division between the vessel and the shard. I will go wherever you demand, she said, my god. Very well. He moved on to speak with the nine, and Ja not planned her next steps. She had to pretend to sulk, had to try to find a way out of going to Emil. She had to hope that she wasn't successful. Odium suspected that she'd helped the Radiant Shallan. He was watching to see that she didn't contact other Radiants, so she wouldn't. Once he'd found her windspring and unmade them to lose minds and memories, he would hopefully be content and not see the other child she'd sent. And Ja not herself? She would go to Teravangian and watch him as asked. And she would stay close, for Teravangian was a weapon. So that is chapter Interlude 2 from Rhythm of War. I hope that you guys enjoy the book, which is out right now. I've been very excited by the response to it. And thank you all so much for supporting me and my writing.